Hey everybody, welcome on back to the read-through, and let's talk about while and do loops. Consider a program that outputs all even numbers from 0 to 12. One way to write this is as follows. Let me see the console.logs, 0 through 12. If we click on that and run it, we see the log to the console. Very fancy. That works, but the idea of writing a program is to make something less work, not more. If we needed all even numbers less than 1,000, this approach would be unworkable. What we need is a way to run a piece of code multiple times. This form of control flow is called a loop. Uh, yeah, we can make this a vocab word. So we'll say, go back to our notes here, say a loop, <clears throat> a form of control flow that repeats a section of code. Now that was the first time where we tried to do one from memory. And honestly, copying and pasting is great. But I would really suggest that when you're trying to write these vocab words, if you end up doing something similar but not exactly what we're doing in these read-throughs, uh, try to write them from memory first and then go back and see if you've got it correct. So, um, piece of code multiple times, um, a form of control flow that repeats a section of code uh, a certain number of times. That seems reasonable enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, I'm going to apologize. I'm in allergy season, so... Um, yeah, that's going to be part of this. So looping control flow allows us to go back to some point in the program where we were before and repeat it with our current program state. If we combine this with a binding that counts, uh, we can do something like this. We have a let number, so we've created a binding, assigned a value of number to be zero for this, and, th and that's what they mean by the state of the program. <clears throat> that's one of the things they mean. Uh, while number is less than or equal to 12, console.log number, number is equal to what number was plus two. Uh, and so if we run this, we'll see that we get the exact same output. And I feel like they're gonna discuss in depth or in more detail what all this is doing. Uh, so we'll wait for that. A statement starting with the keyword while creates a loop. The word while is followed by an expression in parentheses, and that's gonna be this guy. And then a statement much like if. Ah, okay, so, so pretty much just like it's like an if statement, except it's going to repeat until the if statement's condition is not true anymore. Uh, the word while, much like if, the loop keeps entering that statement as... Well, we'll just let that fire truck go by. Anyway, the loop keeps entering that statement as long as the expression produces a value that gives true when converted to a boolean. So essentially, as long as the number is less than or equal to 12, this is going to keep running. At a certain point, and it's basically after this, uh, the number becomes, uh, you know, 14, I think. And what we're going to do is we're going to show something. Uh, we're going to console.log the number after the loop is done as well. So if we run this, you can see that now it's uh, 14. And one real quick note is we can also say something like after the loop is done. <clears throat> and what we've done here is console.log, as we recall from previous videos, will allow you to input multiple arguments, and it'll just output them all with a space in between that. So if we run this, we can now see that we have a nice label applied to the value of number, at least after the loop is done. So the number binding, <coughs> excuse me, the number binding demonstrates the way a binding can track the progress of a program. Every time the loop repeats, number gets a value that is two more than its previous value. At the beginning of every repetition, it is compared with the number 12 to decide whether the program's work is finished. As an example that actually does something useful, we can now write a program that calculates uh, and shows the value of two to the 10th power. We use two bindings, one to keep track of our result and one to count how often we have multiplied this result by two. The loop tests whether the second binding has reached 10 yet, and if not, updates both bindings. So we got a result, counter, while the counter is less than 10, the result is gonna be equal to result times two, and that's applying our power of two in a continual fashion, and then our counter is gonna be equal to counter plus one. If we constantly log the result after it's done, well, it's first we got to click on it, and we hit Command Enter or Control Enter, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC, uh, respectively. So there's our uh, 1,024. So a couple cool things that we could do. Well, cool might be a bit of a stretch, but I find it kind of interesting. Uh, we could change this, and so instead of being uh, 2 to the 10th, this is going to be 2 to the 9th, which is 512. Or we could do 2 to the 12th, which is going to be 4,096. So... Uh, you could see that the structure of this would be something uh, akin to um, this is the value that we're raising to a power, and this is the power that we're raising it to. So the rest of this program could be pretty much interchangeable. Let's say that we wanted to raise 3 to the power of 4. We would just adjust these two values, 
and then make sure that the answer was correct. Excellent. The counter could also have started at 1 and checked for less than or equal to 10. So that makes sense, right? <clears throat> when we go from 0, we want to make sure that it never gets to the value that we want it at, which is to say the counter needs to be less than 4 to raise 3 to the 4th power. Actually, let's go back to 2 to the 10th. That'll be a little bit easier. So if we go back to 2 to the 10th, back to the original example. So if we were to change the counter to 1, we just need to make sure that this goes to less than or equal to 10. And in case, well, you probably can't tell, but I ran it again. <clears throat> let's change it real quick. So yeah, we'll change it back to 10, and there. So the counter could have also started at 10, but for reasons that will become apparent in chapter 4, it's a good idea to get used to counting from 0. Uh, I second that. I don't buy the idea that trying to get around the idea of counting from 0 is something you should ever get involved in. Um, counting from 0 is the way that we do, which is to say, um, well, no, that's the way you say it. We count from 0, so get used to it. Um, it's annoying, but it is one of those things where it'll take you a couple of doing it in your heads and getting it wrong, and then you'll figure it out. So we haven't written anything in our, uh, um, what would you call it, vocab list for a while. Um, maybe we should put while in there. So while is followed by expression parentheses and statement much like an if, the loop keeps iterating as long as that same produce value is going to be true and converted to boolean. It seems to be pretty reasonable. I'm also going to copy and paste this just because I don't know that this is as useful as something like return statement or some of the other ones side effect. These are definitions that might be useful. A while loop falls into that category of things you're going to use so often. You don't really need uh, to have definitions like this, but it never hurts to have it all in one place. So we'll say while, um, a, oh boy, a statement is followed by an expression in parentheses and then a statement much like if or a control flow mechanism. Sure. Oh, it's a keyword, that's right. A keyword. That'll be reasonable for now. Uh, the binding number demonstrates a way. Okay, we already read all of this, so let's go back down. Okay, so chapter four is where they're gonna introduce how useful it is to count from zero. Uh, it's probably, well, let's not speculate. A do loop is a control structure similar to a while loop. It differs only on one point. A do loop always execute, executes its body at least once and it starts testing whether it should stop only after the first execution. To reflect this, the test appears after the name of the loop. Um, I don't think I read that correctly. To reflect this, the test appears after the body of the loop. Ah, of course, okay. So do, and it's gonna, you know, your name is equal to a prompt, it's gonna prompt say who you are, and then while, uh, basically while your name is not an invalid, um, they're going to explain all this. So okay, so we'll go ahead and run this. It's going to prompt, who are you? Uh, I am the programmer. Well, let's not be, we'll say a programmer. Programmer. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, we can go ahead and hit enter here. And what this is going to do is, uh, because your name is going to be inputted as an empty string, or at least that's how it's going to register, it's going to keep asking me. It's like, hey, who are you, who are you, who are you? Uh, one of the things that we could do, although I think it's going to accept as a string, so it won't matter, but what happens if we put zero? Ah, okay, so that is going to convert it to a string, which is nice. Um, the program will for This program will force you to enter a name. It will ask again and again until it gets something that is not an empty string. Applying the not operator will convert a value to a Boolean type before negating it, and all strings except for the empty string convert to true. Uh, this means the loop continues going around until you provide a non-empty name, which is nice. So that's pretty much it for the while and do loops. Uh, I don't really love going over do loops that much just because I am under the impression that if you can do a while loop, uh, you don't really need to know how to do a do loop, um, mainly because it's, it's just a matter of syntax. Um, I may or may not add that to the notes, but that's not really that important. Feel free to add it to your notes if you wish to. Uh, so that's it for this subsection. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next one.